the New York Times, this is The New Washington. I'm Michael Barbaro. Today, Senator Chuck Schumer. Once you lose an election like that, you look it straight in the eye. You don't flinch. You don't blink. I am not afraid of Donald Trump. I am not afraid of the Republicans. 52% of Americans don't know what we stand for. That changes today. This executive order is, was mean-spirited. It's morally wrong to play a political game with the health care of this country. For the two parties to work together to do the country's business rather than engage in needless brinksmanship. Yesterday's agreement is a ray of hope. So one of my favorites with pictures, they found an original portrait of Henry Clay in Leroy, New York, in a schoolhouse. They agreed to send it here. As he, Tom Carper walks by, and I say, you know, Tom Carper, you look like Henry Clay. Picture him. He's related. He's oh, a my God. You could really see it, huh? Carl Hulse, who did you talk to this week? Uh, Chuck Schumer, the senior Democratic sound. senator from New York and the Democratic leader of the U.S. Senate. Did you see that great picture? You haven't been in here, that, have you? No, I haven't been in here. It's the watercolor by Ivanov of Eleanor Roosevelt, the yeah. D.U.N. That's John Sargent Singer of Teddy Roosevelt. He is now in the Democratic leader's suite that's right off the Senate floor. And uh, I was in there yesterday for the first time since Chuck Schumer has been in there. Harry Reid occupied that office for a long time. Schumer has made his own touches in there. He's hmm. got some uh, paintings up. I have Eleanor. This is a famous painting of her at the U.N., and I just think she's a great lady and was a groundbreaker in so many different ways. And that's Franklin D. Roosevelt's original campaign picture. And those are the actual paintings mm -hmm. that from the National Gallery? Mm -hmm. Yes. The only non-New Yorker I have in this room is LBJ, who's somebody I admire. He's made his changes. He's very excited about having a fireplace. In Brooklyn, we don't have fireplaces. I love it. I can't wait for it to get cold again so I can light fires. And they have these artificial logs so novices like me can light a great fire. So I want to talk, Carl, about what happened this week. The Democrats scored a, a meaningful victory with the president. Yes. yes. Earlier today, the president, quote, blindsided Republican congressional leaders, according to a Republican official, by quickly agreeing with Democrats on a plan to tie funding for Harvey recovery to a three-month extension on the country's debt limit and a stopgap spending bill. Can you, can you recap what happened and, and what it means? Well, you know, hurricanes, natural disasters are always, they provide a way for Congress to spend money and do things that maybe uh, wouldn't be that easy otherwise. They're, they're popular, so you can attach things to that mm -hmm. hurricane relief. So both parties really wanted to attach the debt limit to the Harvey relief. Hmm. And Republicans have traditionally been really reluctant to vote for the debt limit. This to, for raising it? Yes. So the Republicans, Mitch McConnell was saying, well, we'll attach the debt limit increase to Harvey, but we want to do it for 18 months or longer. So we don't have to vote twice before the 2018 elections. And Republicans are in charge, so they're supposed to be able to deliver the votes for this. But they don't have the votes for this in the House or the Senate. Majorities of Republicans in the House and the Senate probably can't raise the debt limit on their own. So that opens the door to the Democrats. So you have to be feeling pretty good about what's gone on the last few days. So we've kind of I really bipartisan do. breakthrough. You know, when Leader Pelosi and I walked into the President Trump's office, we didn't know what to expect. And of course, everyone's sitting there, McConnell and Ryan and uh, the Treasury Secretary Mnuchin and Chief of Staff Kelly and Vice President Pence. We were sort of outnumbered. And what happened in the course of the meeting is, first we decided that we would compromise. They said, this is how we want it. This is really Leader McConnell and Leader Ryan. And we could have said, well, we're not going to help you at all. Instead, we proposed a compromise. Hey, we'll go along with you if you raise the debt limit for three months, mm. and then we'll work out a bigger deal. The Republicans didn't want to do that because then they would have to vote again on raising the debt in, limit. In but, three months' but, time, right. Right, right. You know, in the past, Republicans have said, we're not going to give any help to avoid not paying our debt, and even we may try to shut down the government. 
We said we're not going to do either of those, but we want to keep our leverage. Leverage, right, that this gives them a chance to influence the debate, say we're not going to vote for increasing the debt limit unless you dot, dot, dot. And if we do three months for each, that will be fair to you, fair to us. And Trump, to his credit, understood that, understood that we were compromising, understood that we were sort of trying not to just be partisan, try to work for our advantage, but at the same time, we didn't want to give the store away. And it worked. President Trump shocked everyone, I think, including the people in the room there in the White House, and said, I'm with Chuck and Nancy. And he continued to call them Chuck and Nancy uh, throughout and over the next few days like their best friends. Right. Were you surprised when he took your deal? Yes. And you could see it evolve. He started off the meeting sort of on the other side, and we managed to persuade him. It was pretty good. And and part of that was you showed Paul Ryan these comments, I believe, where he had argued in the past for a short-term extension to make a bigger deal, right? It really annoyed me. He said, we're being political. And Mnuchin said, if you just do it for three months, the markets will collapse. To Paul Ryan, I said, you've done it twice before. And I gave him the dates. To Mnuchin, he kept saying, the markets will collapse, the markets will collapse, we have to do till November 2018. I said, oh, really? I got exasperated. I said, you said it before. I don't believe it's true. It hasn't happened in the past. But I said, I guess the markets would collapse just two weeks after Election Day. Not political. I don't believe it. That, sh- that, that turned Trump around. He sort of nodded and agreed with me. And one of the reasons was the Democrats actually had the votes. Hmm. I think that, that President Trump... You know, he had seen the Republicans flail in trying to repeal Obamacare, and he's looking at the Democrats, and they're offering him the votes and a sure thing, and so he took that. Well, what was it like in there? Would you say it was tense? No, it's sort of friendly. I mean, the one thing, look, Trump and I have gone at each other for a long time. He's called me some names. But he probably was told by Schumer or somebody like that, some other lightweight. The president-elect today dubbed Schumer head clown after the Senate minority leader. They don't have the Senate and Schumer's going around making a fool out of himself. But the one thing we've had is we're New Yorkers. We're pretty direct and we talk right at each other. And it worked. So, Carl, the next day after this deal in the White House, Trump calls Schumer and they have a conversation that Schumer talks to you a little bit about. Right. So that you got another call from Trump today. I got a call early this morning. He said, this was so great. And he here's what he said. He said, do you watch Fox News? I said, not really. He said, they're praising you, meaning me. But he said, and your stations, meaning, I guess, MSNBC, CNN, are praising me. This is great. I mean, the, the Washington Post headline was Trump reaches across the aisle. You know, that, and that's a pretty good headline for a president right. in many respects. When I heard Schumer describe that, conversation on the phone, he sounds a little bemused by what it's like to get a call from the president. I mean, these interactions are, they're like a a kind of an excited kid calling and saying like, can you believe how much people like this? I mean, (laughs) what did you take from Schumer? Yeah, I think there's some of that there. I think, you know, Chuck Schumer has been around the block a lot in both Washington and New York. And he, he knows the ups and downs of press coverage. So, you know, great coverage one day can be right. terrible coverage the next day. But I, I do think that he was uh, somewhat amused by the president's reaction. And the fact that he felt, at least, that what he did yesterday, he got accolades rather than criticism for, because the hard right criticized him, but he felt there were accolades, may help. We'll see. We'll be right back. I think when Donald Trump was elected, Senator Schumer's hopes of being majority leader were dashed. But he then he started to think, well, maybe I can deal with Donald Trump. You know, he called him soon mm-hmm. after the election. The president called Chuck. He thought, well, maybe as two New Yorkers, they can kind of get along. But but it, it didn't work. The president really embraced the conservative side of his constituency, and he and Schumer started going at it on Twitter a little mm-hmm. bit. You know, he referred to the sometimes emotional senator as crying Chuck and, you know, called him an obstructionist and a loser. 
Schumer pushed back a little bit and actually had a really funny video that his staff put together. Remember this. About, you know, Trump's famous cabinet meeting where they went around the table and everybody praised the president. Greatest privilege of my life is to serve as as vice president to a president who's keeping his word to the American people and assembling a team that's bringing real change. Right. And Schumer did one with his, his staff. And it was really I mean, funny. One by one, they're all saying, Senators, yeah. you're yeah. so wonderful. We so <laughs> yeah. love you. I want to thank everybody for coming. I just thought we'd go around the room. Lucy, how'd we do on the Sunday show yesterday? Your tone was perfect. You were right on message. Michelle, how'd my hair look coming out of the gym this morning? You have great hair. Nobody has better you hair know, than before you. Before we go any further, I just want to say thank you for the opportunity and blessing to serve your agenda. That's <laughs> It was a great, it was a great rebuttal. But, you know, as Senator Schumer said, you know, they're they're New Yorkers. They can talk to each other. They can relate. So uh, I think there is an affinity between Senator Schumer and Trump that is lacking, honestly, between the president and Mitch McConnell and Paul Ryan. I just think Trump and Schumer come from similar places and get each other much more than those Republican leaders in Trump. Right. And I guess it's worth noting that, you know, we are, we are talking about two men who come from the outer boroughs yeah. of New York. Queens and Brooklyn, right? right? And, and right. they have a, I mean, that's a, that's, a, that's a meaningful identity. Yeah, I think that's true. And there's, a, you know, and they're both very successful in their fields, right? And, you know, even in, in some periods of Trump's past, a lot of, in common with Schumer's own ideology, you know, Chuck Schumer's not like a super liberal. And he's uh, looked out for Wall Street over the mm-hmm. years to, to his detriment, according to some Democrats. So, you know, there's, there's things that they can build on. So the first week, I said to President-elect Trump, look, we're not going to obstruct you just for the sake of obstruction. If you'll work with us, as long as we can keep our values, we'll work together. But I said to him this. I said, this is like two, three weeks later, I said, You ran as a populist against the Democratic and Republican establishments. And if you're a president like that, you might do some really good things. And I'll try to help you on the things that don't conflict with our values. But if you let the hard right embrace you, as seems to be happening, because by then they were announcing what he was doing, I said, you will not be a success as president. He said, hmm. I suggested him we do infrastructure, sent him an infrastructure plan the first month. Maybe... And let me tell you, the cake is not baked. But maybe they've learned that. Maybe they've learned that the hard right way, which is very good in opposition, because they hate government, they want to knock it down. But the hard right philosophy works very well when you're on the outside, shooting at somebody figuratively. It does not work when you have to govern, because A, a lot of it's impractical. B, a lot of it's just based on negativity. But C, ultimately, it's not where the American people are. The American people, ultimately, when they actually had the ability to repeal health care, didn't want the government to repeal health care, even though when the hard was in saying repeal it and it's the reason for your problems, people said, yeah, maybe we should on them. So maybe this was an aberration, but maybe they're learning either instinctively or intellectually that just embracing the hard right is not going to get them very far. You know... Republicans were actually worried about this and have been since Trump was elected that he could, you know, he was a Democrat at some point in his life and that he could revert to more he told, uh, tendencies. Is that a, He is that told a me today the great sympathy he has for the Dreamer kids, that they are good Americans and they work hard and they don't deserve to be kicked out of the country. I said, well, you have to act on it. You have to really help. He said that today to you? Today, this afternoon. And he tweeted out at Nancy Pelosi's suggestion, evidently, this reassurance that there wouldn't be... Yeah, we be both a... suggested to him some reassurance, and he tweeted it this morning. Right. I think Nancy so suggested it, it, it to him. So it seems to be changing rapidly. Well, on Dreamers, it certainly seems to be changing. We'll see. I, I'm, I don't want to be overly optimistic. And the president is sometimes, as you know, uh, erratic. But maybe it's a change. We'll see. You mentioned the president's interaction with Nancy Pelosi over... DACA. And it feels that Schumer also seems to understand that the president has a kind of soft spot for the dreamers, these undocumented immigrants who are young and were brought by their parents to the U.S. How might Schumer use that perceived soft spot to his advantage? 
I mean, this is a opening a mile wide for the Democrats who want to do something about this. And I think that it means it would be part of a a broader agreement coming up in December. Like you're going to have to fund the government. You're going mm-hmm. you're going to make a big increase in the debt limit. You're going to do something about the dreamers. But, you know, for the Democrats, and I pressed the senator on this a little bit, they're also going to have to make some concessions, and that would probably be on border security. Hmm. Well, I told the president today, again, absolutely, we are not for the wall. No ends, ifs, or buts, and we're not trading it for anything. But border security, when we did the immigration bill back in 2013, the bill that McCain and I led and got the support of almost every Democrat and you know, 14 or 15 Republicans got 68 votes. Uh, We had very tough border security. Right. And everyone went along with it. So is this a matter of semantics and just get away from the wall? No, I think the wall doesn't work. I think it's hugely expensive. I think it involves eminent domain. It's ineffective. You can dig under lots of walls. Uh, Drones and electronic devices are more effective. And I think it's, you know, ultimately it's a horrible symbol. If around the world... The symbol of America became a wall rather than the Statue of Liberty, a foreboding sign rather than a welcoming sign. I think that will affect us very seriously in terms of our leadership in the world, in terms of the country we are, in terms of the morality. So um, I think it would be a very bad idea. So I want to talk about Schumer outside of his relationship to Trump. How well does someone like Chuck Schumer as Senate Minority Leader represent the Democratic Party? How do Democrats feel about his leadership at this point? I think that his colleagues in the Senate are uh, happy with him. Uh, he, you know, Harry Reid was his predecessor and also a big political mentor. Mm-hmm. Harry Reid, uh, you know, didn't always uh, take a lot of time to listen to a lot of his colleagues. You know, he sort of, they would plan out their strategy and execute it. Chuck Schumer is much more of a touchy-feely guy with his membership you know, they call him all the time. When we were in his uh, office, he was getting calls. You know, he's quick to pick up with members. You know, I think that he's also got, he's got a really difficult job coming up, though, because so many of the people in his caucus, Senate Democrats, a whole bunch of them are going to be running for president. So they're all going to have different ideas and agendas and priorities. And he's going to have some trouble uh, sorting all that out. Hmm. What's it like being in charge of a caucus where nearly every member is running for president? What I've tried to do is treat this caucus as almost my second family. And we all have to look out for each other. So even though people are running for president, it has not hurt us in any material way. And in fact, I think in some ways it's helped us. We have been unified. We were unified on health care. We were unified on just about every other issue. And there are times when we're divided, but not in a way that hurts us or that's essential. And so those who are running for president, look, let a thousand flowers bloom. It's amazing talent. But I have not found any of them to do things destructive to our caucus while they're running for president. And so uh, it hasn't really hurt. Our caucus has been amazingly unified and everyone watches each other's back. They've been very supportive of me, for which I'm grateful. They may Um, start stabbing in those backs later, though. Not yet. I would try, you know, when they're out on the campaign trail, they can do whatever they want. But when they're in our Democratic caucus, they should avoid that. And I will make that very clear. I do wonder, though, given how deep Democratic lawmakers' objections are to this president, and given how objectionable many of his policies are to them, whether it's cracking down on immigration or banning Muslims from entering the country from several of these foreign countries, how much tolerance will they have for their leader, Chuck Schumer, doing a lot of deals? Is that that what they want? Or at a certain point, will they say, why are you doing deals with this president? Yeah, I I think that's going to be his balancing act. How far do you go in accommodating the president and getting a compromise? And how strongly do you stand against him? I mean, there's already some Democrats in the House, particularly, who are complaining about this deal. They think that Nothing should go through that does not already include a dreamer bill. Hmm. I'm joined now by Democratic Congressman Luis Gutierrez of Illinois. Tonight, there are hundreds of thousands of dreamers that are not overjoyed, that are not happy, because they have not seen a Democratic Party who could have used their leverage today to have said, 
There is no vote on the debt ceiling. There is no vote on the CR unless we carry with it 800,000 oh, dreamers so you, and put them in a safe place. Right. So, yeah, this is this is going to be a, a, a tricky thing for him to navigate. But, you know, Democrats and Chuck Schumer, they like to do things. They want to govern. As he said a couple of times in the interview, you know, we're not just going to obstruct for obstructionist sake. If there's a way we can accommodate, we will. But, you know, to the point where uh, they make deals where Trump becomes more successful, mm -hmm. looks a little less <laughs> bad, I guess I would say, in governing, you know, has a harder time in governing. I, I think there'll be some pushback and there already is some. But this is, you know, this is early mm -hmm. on. And of course, it could it could flip in a second. Uh, I just want to go back a little bit and walk through something of the arc of your recent months. Looked like you were going to be the majority leader. Yeah. Working with Hillary Clinton, your former colleague in the Senate. Then the election happens. Huge disappointment. Huge. I taught. Well, here's a little story about that. I was totally surprised by the election. I, call, I had called up Hillary's chief pollster strategist at 8 p.m. Tuesday night, and I said, boy, these exit polls I'm looking at in North Carolina and Florida of college-educated women look bad. Don't worry, our firewall in Wisconsin and Pennsylvania and Michigan is immutable. The next day, Paul Ryan calls me up just to say, Congrat, you know, let's work together. And I asked him, did this come as a surprise to you? And I hadn't told him the story of what happened to me at 8 p.m. He told me almost the exact story. It said 6.30 p.m. We called up our pollster. He said, sorry, Paul, Feingold's going to be your senator in Wisconsin. Schumer's going to be majority leader. Hillary will be president. So naturally, I was totally shocked, as everyone was. I was distraught. My daughters were distraught. One of them, as you know, had worked in the Hillary campaign and was looking to work for her. I taught them the old Shirelle song. Mama said there'd be days like this. And we sang it for two days. And I was totally in the dumps. I hardly did anything, which is unlike me, if you know me. But the third day, I had an epiphany, real epiphany. And it went something like this. I said, Chuck, stop moping around. If Hillary were president and you were majority leader, the job would be easier. It would be more fun and you'd get some good things done, which is, after all, why you're there. But with Trump as president and you as minority leader, your job's much more important. That has steeled me through. This is a, this is the toughest job I've ever had, and I've enjoyed it more than any job I've ever had. And, you know, there's always something to worry about in this job. But at the same time, there are always things to do to prevent bad things from happening, which has happened a lot, or try to get some good things done. Thanks so much for the time, Senator. We'll see what happens going forward. It, it seems a little bit like a new day. It's let us pray. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Carl, thank you. Thank you, Michael. The New Washington is produced by Michael Simon Johnson and Michaela Bouchard. Brad Fisher is our engineer. Lisa Tobin is our executive producer. Samantha Hennig is our editorial director. Our theme music is by Jim Brunberg and Ben Lansford of Wonderful. That's it for the new Washington. See you back here next week.